So after two quantum talks, this will be about classical Lorentz gas. So those of you who don't have the quantum intuition may uh, also easily follow, I hope. And uh, in my introductory slides, you will see a lot of overlap with Jens's introductory slides. It was we didn't coordinate our slides, but it's not a problem, I hope. So it's about the Lorentz gas, and, and as uh, Jens, Jens uh, presented the historic background, I will not speak much about the history, but what the, what the two basic models here are, one is the periodic, the other one is the random. The, what is the Lorentz gas? You have infinite, infinitely heavy particles put scatterers put in some points, centered on some points on, in, in space, in Rd, and a light particle or a particle of mass 1 traveling between them according to Newton's law. So flying freely with, um, uh, with constant speed and uh, between two consecutive scattering and, scatter and scattering of uh, elastically from the infinite mass scatterers which are placed there. And the two basic, so there are some notation fixed here, so I will denote by R the radius of the, of the scatterers and, uh, and what I'm interested in is the trajectory, of course. So you have to introduce <coughs> some randomness if you are a probabilist and you want to understand limiting distributions. In the, in the periodic case, as the, as the scatterers are completely deterministically put on a periodic arrangement, you choose an initial direct, uh, random initial direction, say according to uniform distribution of possible velocities, of possible directions, you and in the random case do the same, but you have an extra randomness as your scatterers are placed according to some random point process, which uh, throughout my talk will be a Poisson point process, so uncorrelated points. And uh, what I'm interested in is the trajectory large scale large scale limit of the or large scale asymptotic description of the trajectory this is a very difficult and 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 uh, okay by now classical problem i think i told you everything about this i will have a mixture of 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 handwritten and and printed slides because i'm i'm not able to produce nice pictures i had some hand prepared pictures and i inserted them Okay, so the big question here is, if you initiate, so I told you what, what, the, what, what the dynamics is, there are, these are two different kinds of things, so there are two different problems, and, and you introduce some randomness in the initial condition, say direction of the initial velocity, and the big question here is whether, whether the trajectory, x of t is the trajectory of the, of the of the flying particle, whether the traje trajectory obeys a central limit theorem, or if you are even more, more ambitious and invariance principle under diffusive scaling. How do I do it? Yeah, like that. So what you see here is a diffusive scaling, but it may be the case, as Jens emphasized in his last slide, that that, that other type of, of, of scalings might be there, or even other type of limiting laws, maybe. And there is a huge history here, yes, it started with Lorentz's paper back in 1905, but the mathematically rigorous analysis of the problem in the periodic case, I think it's, it, 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 it's rooted in this, these works of Yakov Grigorievich Sinai and, and Leonia Bunimovich back in the late 70s, early 80s, and the best results are listed here about the periodic case. So if you assume finite horizon, I didn't tell you what finite horizon means, I tell you now. So what you see here is not finite horizon because, the peri because you have arbitrary long, actually deterministically infinitely long uh, free trajectories. If you don't allow that, you can imagine easily uh, periodic configuration where you place more scatterers in some places are still periodically in such a way that you don't allow infinite horizon. Uh, you don't allow unboundedly long, long uh, free flights. Now, Bunero Sinai, as you all know well by now, uh, proved back, so this is a, 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 a groundbreaking paper back in 1980, in two dimensions they proved the central limit theorem. They proved many other things, and as a consequence they proved the central limit theorem with 
standard diffusive scaling. I think this is really one of the great results. I quote here a historic background. And, uh, and what they do is reduction of the problem. So they don't treat it as a probabilistic problem, but as a dynamical problem. So it is, it, the periodic case is, can be reduced to hyperbolic dynamics factorized to one period and look at the dynamical system there and they develop enormously strong uh, technical tools for analyzing the, the dynamical system side of, side of the problem. So that was two dimensions as you see quite some time later the three dimensional pro or more than three and more dimensional problem was settled in the finite horizontal case horizon case there are some assumptions here so it's not the two dimension is absolutely settled the three dimensions there are some some assumptions made but certainly the same is true so invariance principle holds now when when the horizon is infinite that means the picture you saw before and what 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 uh, Jens also mentioned in his talk then there was a conjecture formulated by by uh, Pavel Blecher back in, as you see when namely that you should overscale you should scale slightly more than than uh, than uh, than the standard central limit theorem and and question yeah, no problem and uh, and this is due Blecher's argument is essentially the same but of course much more involved than what we learn in probability theory when when we prove central limit theorem on on how do you call it with just on the borderline of the of the of the domain of attraction of of of, of the of the of the normal distribution so you need something like that this was not a proof this conjecture was settled in two dimensions only in two dimensions by that by 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 Domokos Stars and and Tomasz Varyu in a paper and let me just advertise that that in three dimensions or more is absolutely wide open I speak about no uh, Boltzmann grad so here you just take as it is take the problem as it is and what what I wrote there so it's widely open in three in three and more dimensions as far as I know now the random the random scatterers. When you speak about the random scatterers, you expect that the problem is probabilistically, I mean this problem I speak about, the central limit theorem, must be somehow easier because we have more randomness in it. But nevertheless, it turned out that, that it's not. So why? Because there are no methods. So of, it, in principle, philosophically, might be more easy because there is more randomness, but there are no mathematical methods to treat it. So. Uh, that's what I will advertise in this in this lecture. And an absolutely holy grail here is take the problem as I stated with Poisson scatterers, right? Poisson point, uh, distributed according to Poisson distribution. Assume that rho is density. I'm not sure I told you rho is density or, or is the intensity of the Poisson point process. Assume that r to the d times rho is less than a critical value. This is a percolation argument. So if that's too high, then with but then with probability one you will simply be surrounded each point will be surrounded by overlapping scatter there is no way of diffusion so let's assume that we are in that regime and this is a this is a, a number which is not computable but but proved to exist such that if this is, this product is less than a critical value than a percolation critical value conditionally on not being surrounded fully surrounded prove the central limit theorem this is enormously difficult this is indeed a holy grail. I don't think anybody has an idea how to really do it, right? Now, there are two sources of randomness, as I told you already, namely the initial placement of the scatterer and the choice of the initial velocity. I direction, the, the, the direction of the initial velocity, I will choose, as I told you, Poisson point and uniformly distributed uh, directions. And there are, okay, Jens mentioned two ways of proving or two settings for a central limit theorem I put in between a third one namely the first one is what we call an yield namely look at this process as a random process but the randomness coming from from both sides and look at the distribution according to that and when you prove a limit theorem according to that distribution the quenched let me go to the fully quenched which means as Jens said for almost all realizations of the of the of the of the scatterers randomness according to the initial 
direction of the velocity and in between there is physically uh, okay I, I think it's not negligibly important one what is in between the two indeed logically what I call semi quenched namely when uh, when you prove in probability with respect to the distribution of the with respect to the scatterers and I want to emphasize that this is this is physically relevant the other one is uh, the fully quenched of course is stronger but uh, in all this context of random walking random environment diffusion in random environment and so on when people prove central limit theorems about uh, with martingale approximations and this type of techniques this is the type of result you get okay does it go Now the Boltzmann-Grad limit, of course you all know, but I have these preparatory slides. The Boltzmann-Grad limit is the limit when you have, in both cases, is the limit when you get the, it's an elementary computation, the free flight length, the typical free flight length uh, of order one, right? And it's an elementary computation to see that the limit, and this is what I will consider later, let there are more than one way to formulate it because you can also play with scaling time and space but my, my, my formulation is that let r go to zero density go to infinity in such a way that this product goes to say one or anything and uh, and that will be the limit I consider and as it was already I think mentioned I'm not sure whether but I, yes yes Jens mentioned so the random case now I changed order for some reason the random case I changed order because historically now it, people, things come in this order. Uh, the random case was 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 treated in Gallavotti in this paper of Gallavotti, and later by Herbert Schwann in some more general setting with more general point processes with sufficient mixing. Namely, they prove in the annealed setting. In the annealed setting, they proved. This is very important how you formulate it. So let me be very precise here. Fix a capital T, a finite whatever length, so no matter how, how large, but finite, finite capital T. Look at the physical process up to that time. Take this limit and what they prove is that uh, in the, under this limit, as a stochastic process, this process will converge to a Markovian jump process, Markovian flight process, as it was described by in Jens's, Jens's talk. Namely, fly exponential, so the, in plain words, this limiting process is, is a Markovian, it's essentially it's a random walk. Flies exponential, independent exponential, independent identically distributed exponential fly, uh, exponential in times, and between and at these exponential times, the velocity is changed according to a scattering kernel, which in the case of hard spheres, as I speak about hard spheres, we'll see later that this could be changed. But let's speak about hard spheres. This is explicit as it appeared in one of Jens's slides. So the mind that, that, that there is an explicit expression here and three dimensions is somewhat special. Right? Now that was that was the periodic, so it goes back to 69, say, or 71, when it was actually published. And, uh, and the periodic case, as again, I, I'm sorry, I overlapped with Jens, but <laughs> we didn't coordinate our slides, I'm sorry about this. Uh, OK, this is a long history, and I'm, I apologize, I, I will not have time, and I didn't have space here to list all names. So starting with, with Calliot and Gauss's result in two dimensions and ending with Markov and Sternberg's result in, 20, in, uh, in arbitrary, in three, and, say in three dimensions, uh, they prove formally, formally a similar statement. I mean that, that in the Boltzmann-Grad limit there is, a, there is a limit of the process up to any finite time, but the process on the right-hand side is not anymore this simple to describe. I would call it a hidden Markov flight process because in the background there is a Markov process which is I will not describe now so you have to take into account some, some, uh, some hidden Markov variables and in terms of that it can be described but what's very important that, you, that, that the flight times have also heavy tails which are explicit heavy tails depending on dimension but heavy tails. So this is the Boltzmann grad this is the Boltzmann grad, and then once you have the Boltzmann grad, you can think 
about the two steps a bit, because in the end we are interested about diffusion. In the end we are interested about diffusion. Uh, the two steps in the in the random case is is essentially straightforward, but it's straightforward because Donskar did the work for us. Munro Donskar did the work for us, or Erdős and and Katz and Munro Donskar did the work for us, namely that that once you have this random walk process in the limit, take a second limit and uh, apply Donskar's theorem, you will get you will get diffusion, and that's what we wanted. Of course, we want a bit more. In the periodic case, this is slightly more subtle because the limiting pro the, 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 the Boltzmann grad in the Boltzmann grad the limiting process you get is not a random walk in the sense of sums of independent or essentially independent random variables. You have to work a little bit more for it. And we have a paper with Jens, joint paper, in which we prove, and in any dimension, mind that there was a remark there before that, that, that without Boltzmann grad it settled only in two dimensions, that in three, in any dimensions, we prove the invariance principle with super diffusive scaling. The super diffusivity comes from the long flights. Good. So this, this much about, about about uh, about historic background and now let's see what can we do better and i will i will be interested in 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 the in the random case in the poisson case because in the random case we do not have any result about fixed just the diffusive scaling right so what i mean here could we could we find some result which interpolates between what I call the holy grail and what is well understood the two steps limit, right? In the periodic just, and this is the last time I mentioned the periodic case in my talk, uh, in the periodic case, the same question in D greater than three or uh, greater than or, equal, or dimension equals three would be interesting because in two dimensions we do have the fixed scatterers result in that uh, Blaher conjecture proved in, in, two, in the two-dimensional case by Sass and Varu. But nevertheless, this intermediate scale is there, there is also is also interesting. But in three in three and more in three dimensions would be would be absolutely interesting. Ex -ex Question: yeah. When you mention the two-step two limit, does it mean that you have to do two limits separately, or yeah. that you can just uh, put them together? No, two steps. It it's two steps. It is two steps. It prove first Boltzmann grad, which is done, and after Boltzmann grad, do the scaling limit. And due to invariance, due to Donsker's invariance principle, a little bit you have to to to, to work on it because. But the first limit, you have it on a on a time which is sufficiently large in order that you can really uh, do. The but for any time, but for any time, yeah. for any fixed time, you have it. Okay, you can define. That's a formal thing. You can define convergence in infinite time scale just as if it holds on any time. It's a weaker convergence. But you have it for any time. Take a t long time scale and divide by square root of t and let t go to infinity. You ask our probabilities, and that's the invariance principle. Right? So it's done. We understand. It's done scare. Right? And here is the interpolation. And this is the first version of the theorem. So this is when I uh, the, the 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 result I'm going to I, I'm I, I concentrate my talk on. Uh, this is a paper which was published. I'll always where you see in dates is the date of publication of the of the paper. I, I try to to do that. So with Chris Lutzko who was when we worked jointly on this. We, he was a PhD student in 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 Bristol. He was actually a PhD student of Jansi's, not mine. And we we proved exactly this type of result. We proved exactly this type of result in three dimensions. So take the random Lorentz gas. Now, let's be very precise. Random Lorentz gas with Poisson point distribution of scatterers, spherical scatterers. Take the Boltzmann grad limit, as I said. And along the limit, and this is what you asked, I think, Lor. Along the limit, take a time horizon ex diverging to infinity, right? and try to prove the scaling in this time horizon, right? Now, this is difficult, more difficult than the two steps limit, because as the longer the time horizon, you, the, long, the longer the memory and the more you have, to, you have to care about, right? And the result is that if your time horizon is such that, OK, certainly it diverges to infinity, but not too fast. It diverges like, as you see there, 1 over r log r squared. 
then the invariance principle holds. Now let's stop for a moment before, before I go on. Namely, I expect, if you wish I may say, I conjecture that this type of result must hold up to any time horizon. So take any t sub r which increases to infinity by any, I mean exponentially far, x to the one, exponential of one over r or even faster, I'm pretty sure that this type of result should hold. I'm able to prove it only up to this time, right? And I have good reason to, to, have, to be able to do it like, uh, only up to that time, you will see later. Uh, and um, another remark I should have written about this, another, okay, but that's too much to say, conjecture. If a result, what I call the holy grail, were true, if it were true, then in the limit you would see a centrally, uh, an invariance principle with some, with some sigma square, with some, uh, how do you call it, uh, variance. The variance would depend on r. Now let r go to zero. And that variance you get there should converge to the same variance. What we have. So there should be some sort of continuity taking various limits. But this is indeed in the, in the, in the domain of dreams because we don't have any. Going beyond, this, going beyond this time horizon is not fully, okay, I don't know how to do it. But that's, that's a good challenge because it's probably, if one is clever enough to invent something truly new, is able to do it. Okay, here are some remarks. Up to a time horizon of order 1 over r, which is still infinite time horizon, uh, the problem is purely probabilistic. There is no dynamics in it, and that's what I will show you. It's, in this sense, it's simpler. Nevertheless, it gives result. First of all, it reproduces Galavotti and Spohn. And more than that, because it goes beyond that. It goes, it goes for a longer time horizon and... and uh, uh, you don't see it from this formulation, you don't see why it reproduces Galavotti and Spohn, but from the next formulation you will see it, because it's based on a, on a, on a coupling. Now, so this is purely probabilistic. This, I don't say it's trivial probabilistic, but it's probabilistic. From R, between these two time scales, geometry will also, so geometry or dynamics, call it as you wish, will, will also play a role. Right? And uh, now, as the theorem is formulated in the paper, and here is exactly the setting I told you, three dimensions, spherical, hard course. It can be expand, extended to any dimension. I, th I know how to extend it. It would be enormously a lot of work. It's not the case that I wrote down, to, that I see that it can be expanded, extended to any dimension, up to time horizon of r to that power times the power of a logarithm or divided by a power of a logarithm. So this two here is one, this, uh, how do you, yes, this two here is three minus one. And in two dimensions, this would be just that. In two dimensions, the method doesn't give more than the pure probabilistic uh, statement. You will see why. This is important because this tell, this gives, I will tell you the method that this tells you the limitation of the method. Physically should be true for beyond, but the method doesn't give better. And it can be also extended to other short range interactions and, and under some conditions. So I use, I use the fact that we are in three dimensions and we are hard cores, but, but I will show you how to go, how, 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 how to extend. When I say it can be extended, I don't mean that I have a paper written down, but that I know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. By yes. short range, you mean that uh, there are Finite range, finite range. Uh, yes, compactly supported. Compactly supported. That's important in the method. Compactly Just because the alpha. The alpha is always the same, right? Uh, in, in I probably I would be able to to compute it. I didn't take the. I don't know. I can't answer you now, but I see how it comes out and. and Sorry. But, yeah, of course. And in the in the cross section, you you mentioned that the dimension three is, uh, is special because the measurement exactly. is uniform. But yeah. it, it it is also never an advantage to change the direction. It, it doesn't become better by having this sort of biased uh, random walk. No, that's not. Uh, what matters is that it's it's renewed without memory. 
but it, it doesn't this bias random walk doesn't help what do you mean by bias I mean that the, 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 the exit distribution is not uniform on the sphere it doesn't help you to have less memory in some dimension uh, no I don't think it helps I don't think it helps it's it makes it technically more difficult I will tell you exactly at, at a later slide why but it's not essential difficult it's difficult, it would take another 10 pages to, to, to extend the argument, but I will tell you exactly what, I will be very, very explicit about this. Good? Okay, and the idea, the idea of proof is coupling. I come from, partly from probability background, so I, that's what I like, coupling. Coupling means what? Realizing you want to prove something about the process, sarcastic processor, you understand another one much better, try to realize them on the same probability space in such a way that you can learn about the, the easier one, something. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's fun, that's fun. Okay, and the coupling, you don't see yet here what the coupling is, you will see on the next slide that let's assume, so that I, you see the claim of what kind of coupling I can, I can realize. Namely, take the Markovian flight process. Of course, the Markovian flight process is essentially a random walk. I understand it perfectly well. I, do have, I know everything about it. And, on the, and denote by u its velocity process that will be just a jump process, right? Uh, okay, you understand what it, it will be, the, the velocity is in exponential time intervals. And the other one be the Lorentz process, that's my, that's the physical mechanical process, which for some reason I call it the Lorentz exploration process and you will see why. But that's the Lorentz, that's the process, that's the physical, x is a physical process and denote the velocity of the physical process by vt, but the randomness, okay, I think about the physical process as an annealed process. So the randomness comes from everywhere, and I realize it in a sense which, for the probabilists maybe, but others also must understand. So it's constructed from y, so once y is constructed. How is y constructed? Give me a bag of independent and exponentially distributed random variables and a bag of independent uh, uniformly distributed variables and from there I construct the process y, right? Once that is given, I can consect, I can, I can sequentially construct the process xt in such a way that it's measurable with respect to the sigma, so I don't have to look forward in time. Just looking backward in time in, for the y process, I know exactly what happened for, with the x process up to that time, right? Uh, and and the, the idea of construction will be that this u and v, the two velocities, try to stay parallel all the time. Try to stay, x and y cannot stay parallel once they depart, they are away. But you try to keep the two velocities parallel this will not work for all time. Sometimes they have to do different things because they are two different processes. But what, what I claim is that these mismatches occur with, very, with, low, with frequency of order r. r is the radius, which is a small parameter, right? And after mismatch, they are recoupled. By recoupled, I mean that they are put to the same value after times of order 1. So these are the two things. If I can do that, you, I will, I'll tell you how, how I do that. You don't see it yet. If I can do these two things, then here is some hand-waving arguments of, of, show, of proving the theorem. These are not proofs, of course. You don't see the logarithm, for example. Uh, if this is the case, that means that up to time of order 1 over r, with high probability, nothing different happens. So the two stay together, and here is the proof of the up to time 1 over r, of course, once you have the construction, right? And from time 1 over r, you will start seeing the differences. They will depart, they will, they will do different things occasionally. But they, if I'm right, what I'm saying, that in what I'm saying, then after mismatch in order 1 time, they come back and you try to evaluate this maximum. You try to evaluate this maximum of the difference. This is a capital T here, I'm sorry, this is bad. This is divided by square root of capital T, of course. Yes, this is an elementary, just put the, the, the absolute values inside. And you get this expression as an upper bound, divided by square root. You see that this will go to zero as long as square root of t times r goes to zero, which means t is not bigger than 1 over r squared. You don't see the logarithms, you don't see corrections, but the, the idea is, right? And you also see that, I'm, that I do the most stupid thing here, because if I can do, these are random processes, 
when I put inside the absolute value from outside, then I switch from fluctuations to, to very, very rude computations, so the flow of large numbers type of computation. So if I was more clever than this, I could keep outside the absolute values, and here I could probably have a square root of t instead of a t in the integral. Ah, by the way, I didn't tell you why this integral is of order t, because be, uh, t times r, t times r, because you integrate from 0 to t, you have altogether r times t mismatches, if I'm right, and each mismatch time it lasts of order 1. So that's why, why you, have, you have this, this very simple upper bound. But uh, this, is, this is just the, the, the this, uh, back of the envelope. And here is the in plain words. I'm not writing formulas because I think you understand better from plain words what I'm doing. OK, what I'm doing, let me go back to the, yeah, I don't go back to the picture. So uh, when I explained you the process, I put down the scatterers from start. All scatterers were there, and I started the process. Now, the annealed picture, in the annealed picture, you don't need all the scatterers at place from start. You go, as you go along the way, you explore your, 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 and you just put a scatterer when you see a new scatterer. You put it there, you see, you keep it there forever. So what I'm doing is xt and, so the process and the construction of the environment are done together. Are done together. And the explored areas are recorded and not changed anymore, of course, because I want to keep the memory. What is explored area? Not only the scatterers themselves, but the corridors, the tubes, the tubes of radius R around the past trajectory. That, these are recorded. So whenever you come back to these areas, you know what you, are, you must do. Otherwise, when you are outside and you explore virgin area, then the process, the process behaves like a random process. So what I want, what I have to control is what happens when you are in the overlapping times, right? And that's written here. So, but of course, things can go wrong. Things can go wrong. So it's not that simple. What can go wrong? I'm not sure. Can you see the handwritten? Can you see this slide well? Yeah. So on the left hand side you see the phys uh, you see the, the yellow thing is the is uh, the yellow trajectory is the Markovian is the random trajectory and I construct the blue one which is the physical which is the mechanical trajectory right so the yellow one but you, sorry I did something wrong here and I don't know what it takes some time till it comes up good uh, so this, this is the construction of the error. So fly exponentially, exponential long time, change your velocity, renew your velocity independently. That's in three dimensions. Renew your velocity independently, fly exponential, renew independently, fly exponential, renew, fly exponential. You try to mimic that. Fly, it's, it, I just started my, my job, so I don't have any information about the environment. I sweep the environment, but due to the fact that my environment is Poisson, the flight time, this is exactly the computation you do when you, when you, when you compute for the boltzmann grad limit, what you should, should do. The flight time is exponential. When you change velocity, you place your scatter and that's there forever. Fly on, again change velocity, place your scatterer, fly on, place your scatterer, fly on. At this moment I know that I have these three scatterers, I don't know the fourth one yet. Fly on and this guy didn't get yet, so the, 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 the Markovian guy just do, doesn't remember what happened here, so just flies until that time, right? But the, but, the mar, but, the, but the mechanical guy knows that there is a scatterer scatters away as it, he should or she should, right? S flies as long till the next exponential clock rings and then follow the instruction. The instruction is this one, get parallel. Of course, it may happen that you can't do it better because you are still, when the new instruction comes, you are still in wrong area. So these are the technical parts of the proof that this happens with very small probability, right? This is one thing which can go wrong. The other thing which can go wrong, here is another trajectory. Fly, change, fly, fly. Here you get, 
Here, here the guy, the, the Markovian guy, got an instruction to change velocity from the exponential clock. But the non-Markovian guy knows that she cannot change her velocity here because it's in the tube, right? So flies on till the new, that long time, till the new instruction comes. And assuming that the new, that, that, that nothing, that, that ma there is no other memory element there, follow it and get parallel. Of course, when I say there is no other memory element, these are difficult proofs or more or less difficult proofs, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the coupling. I explained you what the coupling was. And this can be written down by formulas. It's not long to write down by formulas. Good. Okay. And here is the theorem now. The previous theorem was a consequence of this one, that this is the precise formulation of the theorem. The precise formulation of the theorem is that, so, and this is the main theorem in that paper, is that in three, we do it in three dimensions because we use the fact that we are in three dimensions, take the Boltzmann graph limit, up to time of order of small order one over r, the two processes are the same. Up to times of order, what you see there, the two processes are not anymore the same, but exactly what I told you can be done. Namely, in probabil the probability that the scaled maximum, whatever, is greater than the delta. So if you do the proper scaling, you get exactly what you need for the, for the invariance principle. Why? Because I have the invariance principle, principle for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the probabilistic object. So this is the theorem. Good. And here is a very simple little lemma which, is, which ex explains a lot. It is a probabilistic lemma which explains a lot. What the, the, the powers we have there and all that. This, what you see here, in, and I'm sorry, I hope you can see it. Not quite. This is d minus 1 log r, r to the k, r to the d minus 1 log r, and this is r to the d minus 1, that's not visible very well, anyway. Okay, so this is, the yellow guy is the probabilistic object. It's a random walk, it's a random flight process, Markovian random flight process. The event you see here is the following. Start from that point, make k, at least k scatterings, maybe more but not less. By scattering I mean change velocity at least k times. And the event of, uh, of the probability of which I ask is that after this, after at least k, after k or more scatterings, the guy comes back in the r neighborhood of the starting or the 3r neighborhood of the starting point. This is a random, this is a probabilistic problem. You can give it to maybe with some effort of a good probability student or PhD student can compute it. It's not totally trivial because there are some green function computations in it and you have to understand. It's analysis. And the statement is the following. In, we, are in three, we are in three and more dimensions. That's very important that this, this is valid in three and more dimensions. In two dimensions, I, I have to do something different. Up to k, not bigger than dimension minus two, this probability is bounded above by r to the k. In three dimensions, only one single k is included here, k equals one. At k equals d minus one, you will have as it comes here, r to d minus 1, but you will already have a logarithmic correction. And logarithmic correction with this power of the logarithm, <coughs> what you see. These are precise powers, right? And after, if, you, if I ask about 100 collisions in three dimensions, you don't gain more. You don't gain more as, as, as for three collisions. So the order of magnitude of coming back to the R neighborhood after 100 collisions will be just a co smaller constant, but still R to the R, R cubed, right? And, uh, and this is important. Let me tell you why. This tells you how to prove the theorem and also tells you what the limitations of the theorem are. Because my proof, well, maybe I, I give you the proof and I come back to this later. I mean, I give you the idea of the proof. I don't give you formulas. There are computational parts, which I'm not. What happens? Uh -huh. No, I, my, I jumped. Yes. Yes, OK, and this is the next one. Yeah, sorry, before going to the next one, I, here. Up to the first half of the theorem follows from this lemma. 
because that's that's only probability you have the you have from this lemma you it's exactly okay half at least that the first bad thing doesn't happen up to time of order r is of the is of negligible probability follows because simply you don't come back so the the y process doesn't come back the x process by construction is equal to the y process i didn't say anything about the the second type of wrong of this shadowed when in the tube you but that's just a by a time reversal is the same so if you think about it a little bit reverse time and the second type of bad events are the time reversed first time of bad events right and let's go I, and this proves yes that's what written there this 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 argument proves what uh, up to time one over r now up to also this lemma tells you how to try to prove what is the good strategy to prove to go beyond to go to longer time scales you have to on longer time scales you will see recollisions you will see bad events you will see mismatches you have to control them but if you think a little bit about that lemma you will easily convince yourself that the mismatches or bad events which may occur up to a time scale of order 1 over r squared possibly with logarithmic correction will be only what i call direct recollisions and direct shadowings by direct recollision i mean recollision with the last scatterer it will not happen it's easy to write down formally that of course it needs a proof because this is just a guess based on the probabilistic arguments but up to time of order r squared say r squared divided by log r squared after times of order 1 over r 1 over r squared times 1 over log r squared that's the correct thing what i'm saying it will not happen that you recollide the physical object will recollide with a scatterer which was seen more than not just in the immediate past it needs a proof of course and you will see how i prove it but the, but but this is what you expect you expect only direct recollisions what you see here so you bump between the two scatterers for a number of times, leave, and that's it. Or direct sh shadowings. That means that there is a sharp collision here, and at this time point, it gets the instruction that it should do something, but it's not allowed to do. But by direct, I mean that this is not in the tunnel of some older part of the path. Of, of the path. Right? And moreover, what I call it Xi2, that means after the first collision, the length of the flight in this case between the collision between the first and second collision so the distance between the two scatterers and here this flight this will be small order of one so that's easy to see that if not if not or easy to convince yourself not to prove to convince yourself from the probabilistic object that this should be what you you should fight against this right how to fight against this how to fight uh, fight against this I define an intermediate. This is, I think I like this one. <laughs> I define an intermediate, which I call a myopic object. The myopic object, the myopic object, first of all, doesn't take into account older recollisions. So all you start to follow to make the construction as I did before, but erase those scatterers from the picture, which happened and those tunnels which happen more than one scattering before that's one thing and also erase those er so if if after a scattering if after a scattering a flight longer than one occurred then you can erase that forget about that scatterer you can easily define a process like this you can define a process which will not be markovian and not will, will not be constructed by independent parts immediately but if you step behind backwards too and look at it then you can see that you can build it up from independent from independent steps namely break down the the size are the successive uh, the successive flight times and there are successive new velocities in there but i didn't write break up the sequence of flight times into blocks which are separated by two plus two, two plus two long flights by long i mean longer than one so the separating parts are you had two long flights and uh, just before and two long flights ahead and you easily see that these blocks will be fully independent these are of random length these will be of random length 
but you can write down independent distribution of these guys such that if you put them together this is this this will be just the sequence of, of, of uh, I mean, each block is a, 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 a collision with a, in, a direct collision uh, string. Direct collisions occur, so this is this safety or safety zones uh, ensure that direct collisions occur inside. In the interval, may occur direct collisions, but but these are broken up into independent legs like this, right? And now the problem breaks down to two steps, namely, prove that, and by the way, the length of such an object is exponentially tight. It's just elementary probability. So these are of random lengths, but exponentially decaying uh, probability of, 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 of the length. So these are independent legs. Construct the process Z, which I told you, within these legs. So the Z process will be a sort of random walk, a very complicated random walk, but independent steps put together, right? And now comes two elements of the proof, namely that within one leg, within one leg, so take just this leg, this is a finite sequence of, of exponentials and independent new velocities, construct the X process, the physical process, and construct this myopic process, these two will be identical with overwhelming probability. This is difficult. This is the geometric part. The geometric or dynamical part of the proof is hidden in this part, uh, is in this step. So, so it shouldn't then one be of them Z? The yes, 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 yes. And I knew that there was an error I didn't find. I knew that there were, I knew from when I came from Budapest that I have to correct something. When, <laughs> when I looked at it yesterday, I didn't find what. And you are right, that's a Z. Thank you. Yes. So that X and Z, X and Z, are the same with that probability you see there, and you see the log squared, right? I, I cannot do better. Sergio asked me whether it is indeed necessary the log squared there, isn't enough log. I don't know. I could do it with log squared. It may easily be the case that log is enough, but I was not able to do better. And on the this is and the other one is a probabilistic part again, because Z is built up, the big Z process is built up by independent steps like this. So do green function estimates for this one. It's not an ordinary random walk. It's ordinary in the sense that it's built up of independent steps, but you have to use a lot of things of it. So that two of these, two of these, two, so if you construct the Z pro if you construct the Z process out of these independent legs, there will be no interference between different legs. That's a probabilistic statement, right? And within one leg, X and Z don't differ. This is a probabilistic and dynamical statement. Difficult. Now, I don't want to tell. It's hard to. OK. It's, uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, no, I don't go to the geometry now, but I want to tell you why, wh I want to tell you the limitation, the limitation. I told you that, that you can't do better in, t in, in two dimensions, you can't do better than this. In two dimensions, you can't do better than, than this. And if you are willing to prove, but I don't think many care about Lorentz gas in four dimensions. <laughs> Uh, in higher dimensions, you couldn't do it better than d to d minus 1. And as I told you, it comes from this lemma. It comes from, from this, that up to, up to that time, I mean reciprocal of that time, maybe with some more logarithmic corrections, but up to reciprocal of that time, there are finitely many recollision patterns you have to control. Finitely many recollision patterns you have to control. But beyond, beyond reciprocal of that time, the, uh, beyond uh, time, time scales which are reciprocal of that, all recollision, all complex recollision patterns come in with the same probability. Well, okay, different constants in front, but with the same order of probability. And this type of arguments I told you now don't, don't work, so you have to do something else. Yeah. So this is. As I didn't tell you anything about the geometric argument, I still have some five minutes or something. I want to, I might come back to, the geometric argument is longish and, and uh, I'm not sure in five minutes I can give you sufficient detail to take away something. 
So I'm not going to do this now, but okay, what are the further extensions? Of course, I don't know in other, I'm sure in other cultures, other languages, there are things like that, what we say in Hungarian, once you, in Hungarian, we have, once you have a hammer, you think every, every, everything is a nail. <laughs> so once we have this method, we can, we can do many other things and we do uh, many other things with it, namely, or we could do many other things, some, some are done. Namely, uh, the first outlook is about what can we do, do we with other type of interaction? Okay, in three dimensions, this was very special in three dimensions because this was just renewal of velocity. So I could really from start break up everything in independent. That's how I started. If this do doesn't happen, but, uh, but you have Dublin's condition. I don't know whether this community is well aware of what Dublin's condition is or, or Wolfgang Dublin's ingenious simple thing. Namely that if you have a lower bound on the distribution, on the kernel of a Markov chain, then you can do everything what you can do in independent. Namely, you can break up the Markov chain into independent legs and then, then everything can be done. So that's Dublin's trick. Now, if Dublin's condition holds for the scattering kernel, then rather than having independent steps, we have from start independent legs of random but exponentially tight lengths mu with much more work, but exactly the same thing can be done. Right? And as an example, we, uh, the, okay, the, the, the easiest to, to, to name example is the Ehrenfest wind tree model, which is in a different paper done. Now this is simpler than the spherical from the geometric point of view because the geometry is much simpler. On the other hand, uh, there, are, there is this extra difficulty of, of, of not having independence, of applying, applying the Dublin, Dublin uh, Dublin's trick. Of course, this also will work for dimensions greater than three, not for dimension two, because in dimension two you don't have Dublin. If you don't have Dublin, but you have Dublin for the oh, sorry, this is you have Dublin for the second convolution power, then then you cannot break up into then Dublin's trick is more complex because you can't break up your walk in or your Markov chain into independent legs but into, you recognize something I see, but into independent, one dependent steps. So more probability is needed, but it's doable, right? And here comes something I wanted to mention. There is this, okay, there is the magnetic, you see, I'm inspired by this paper of, of, uh, of Alessia, Chiara and uh, Sergio, recent paper, in which they prove a Conjecture of Bobilev, may I say conjecture, so it's a construction made rigorous. A construction made rigorous. So they prove the following. They prove the following. Take the two-dimensional magnetic Lorentz gas. So this is what, I, this picture is not done by Mary. This is done by Chris Lutzko, so that's why it's so beautiful. Uh, so take the two-dimensional Lorentz scatterers and let your, uh, and let your, uh, that's not an arrow, that, uh, that looks like, this looks like an arrow like the rest, but no, it's not. <laughs> Good. <coughs> and let a charged particle move in, in, in transversal magnetic field that, of course, we all know that it will move in on, 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 on circles of, of fixed radius and scatter. And here is a the trajectory you can see, of course, the scattering is random. The scattering is according to, the, it's all, all deterministic. You may have closed trajectories, you may have much more complicated closed trajectories, and you may have non-closed, so open, infinitely extended trajectories like this. If you take the same assumption that the density is not too high, then you, with pro positive probability you will have uh, infinitely extended trajectories. And uh, what, what, uh, what Sergio and his co-authors, so that means, let me name them all, so Alessia, uh, Chiara and Sergio prove, they make rigorous uh, guess of Bobilev that in the Boltzmann-Grad limit, this process, just as, just as Galavotti did for the, for the Lorentz guess, so they prove that in the Boltzmann-Grad limit, this process converges to a Essentially Markovian flight, but it's a complex Markovian flight process, which I will show you in the next slide. N namely, what you see on, on this side. Namely, that the, the Markov process 
moves okay it's not markov as you see but it's you can you can find the markovity in it so flies flies on circles of radius one but makes after a full circle makes a random makes a random turn as it as there, as there imagine that look at this one look at this one here you have the scatterer the particle comes in from somewhere comes in from here takes a scattering then goes around has the same uh, scattering angle and after an exponential time finds a new a new scatterer right now take the the, the, the the scatterer radius down to zero and you see this picture so that's the process am I right yeah, yeah. now and they prove this convergence what I'm claim that with this method and with this uh, so you the proof is is uh, is like like Galavotti's or Spons, so it's it's computing transition probabilities, I guess. And what I do, what I can, what we do with with, with Chris Lutzko, it's not written up yet. So uh, is that uh, that the same result, but going to longer time scales? We are in two dimensions, so we can go essentially to one over r with logarithmic correction. We can do exactly the coupling, namely, we can couple the physical process with this Markov process in such a way that they stay close uh, it's a bit more work it's a two-step because anyway so essentially that's done uh, that they stay close up to times one over r in this case only probabilistic argument comes in two dimensions we can't go beyond the probabilistic argument right so this is what i wanted to say and uh, what else i think i stop here yes i think i stop here i thank you very much for your attention and uh, that's it. I do have one more slide actually to show you. And as I'm, as I'm the last speaker, I think everybody will join me in thanking our. In the work of uh, Andrea Sederler, Arnaud Guillain, and uh, I think it's Timmer, uh, they have a coupling for which they have a problem that seems a bit similar to use, which is they want to couple two processes, but if the processes are equal, they will repair. And this seems a bit similar to your situation. And so they develop a notion of coupling in which you have to stay very close, but never equal. Um, have you tried an approach like that? No, I don't know actually the, about the work you, you mentioned, so I would be happy to learn about it. So who were the authors you mentioned? Uh, Andrea Sebarla, mm -hmm. Arno Guillain, and I think the third one is Zimmer. It's a uh, sticky mm -hmm. coupling. Uh, sticky coupling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do they prove? Uh, no, I don't know how this works, so I can't answer your question, but anything what's coupling is interesting for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, Jens? <coughs> so it's absolutely critical that you have the Poisson process. That's critical because, because I translate Poisson in space into po exponential in time. Okay. But, uh, of course, we'd like to also understand sort of other possible point configurations sure. like Spohn. Yeah. Is there, do you have then another coupling that would do this for you or? I, I can't answer. So I, I didn't, I didn't think much about it. Probably it's very difficult, but maybe some clever young person can find a, probably you need a second coupling indeed. So you need somehow to map first into Poisson or to something like large scale Poisson. I don't actually know because Poisson, uh, uh, the, the, the processes what Herbert considers in his paper on large scale are Poisson. I mean, if you, if you thin them, then in the limit you see a Poisson. No, but even before the limit, I mean, you take uh a uh, transition rate which depends on x uh, and t. Uh, so no, yeah, that's right, but... I think that you can uh, reproduce the Herbert result via the Gallavotti approach. Just uh, changing the... Instead of having t, you have the integral of the transition rate. That means that the time, the time process, so the... Because in, in my construction, the time process was, x was Markovian. 
So in the time process, you have to change the rate. You take a longer, long memory. Uh, I, 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 agree. I, I agree. Possible. Who knows if, if it's doable? So my, I, I, I think this is a non computer. Of course, there are lots of computational elements, but it tells you exactly what I, in my opinion, my feeling that it's not the computations are what from which you learn, but the phenomena. No, I mean, no. Let, let me say that uh, nonlinear uh, people try to uh, to go away from the hierarch hierarchy, which is uh, the only two uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the case of uh, Herbert did many years ago, it was an, an improvement at that time to, to move from Gallavotti picture, which is very es explicit, to something which is hierarchical. Yeah. <laughs> so in some sense, it's strange. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's just personal remark. Rafael? So on your, on your first slide, you had this cartoon of the proof where you were showing that the, the, this integral and you were taking yep. the absolute value inside. So is it possible to not take the absolute value? Because the mis mismatches somehow should be mostly independent. There should be some... That's what I... S that's, that's, that's what, so if you were able to do... That, first of all, the coupling thing, the coupling goes only up, how should I put it? If in three, di in three dimensions, if I go beyond this time scale, then as I said, all recollision patterns come in. But they are somewhat separated. So there is a chance. So if I just go make this back of the envelope computation without this sweeping under the carpet all difficulties, then this, exactly this argument you said, would give me the optimal result. But of course, there are the hurdles with, with uh, how, how far you can go with the, with the coupling itself, yes. So yes, you, you are perfect, right? So this is just estimating large law of large numbers rather than fluctuations, you lose a lot. But, but why you said in the beginning that you can get to arbitrary powers? Because if I understood the computation correctly, you just gain a square root of something? If, but this is not, this is, I don't claim that I can do this. I just said that, that, I just said that this type of argument shows that if you could do much, let me just go back a little. I just try to find this. Ah, here it was. Here it was. Look, if instead of estimating, if instead of estimate, what do I do? I estimate this thing with uh, with t times r because it's t long, and I have all together t times r mismatches, and each one lasts order one time, so that's how it is. Now what you say is rather than that, estimated by the fluctuations, which would give you square root of t times r. You have square root of t times r divided by square root of t. You get a square root of r there, which goes to zero. So you have the good closeness up to any time, no matter how long the time scale is. But, but this is hand waving. Sure. Yeah. But, but in principle, this shows that if you were able to sort of control the coupling and go be beyond laws of law of large numbers estimate to fluctuation estimate, you would get it to any power, to any, to any, uh, up to almost, essentially almost to the holy grail, just before the holy grail you stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just wondering, but uh, sh shouldn't you change the uh, diffusion coefficient if you push? Uh, no, that that is still no. The diffusion coefficient in this regime is is con is the same. Be beyond this r minus b. And beyond this, I think it's I okay. This is guesswork. This is called, if you wish, to take it as a conjecture. It's the same, and it's the same as as if you took, if you were able to prove, if you were able to prove x, let me just say x t by square root of t, not Boltzmann graduate, fixed r, right? Conditioned on, on no, no trap. Yes? Converges, so this is the holy grail, converges to a normal with some variance which depends on r. Right? This is fixed R. Now, what I think that if this were true, which probably we will not see in our life, 
then as r goes to infinity as r goes to zero as r goes to zero of sigma r is exactly this sigma i get that's what i think and this sigma is all all, all, all in all this range from which i could prove a little You have some correction, but corrections yeah. with R, but those are those are yeah. small oh, corrections. Yeah, yeah, okay, for, for that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there is no other question, I thank, can thank all the speakers of this morning session, and also thank, of course, the organizers. I thank the organizers.